Hello everyone and welcome to this fourth talk in a series of five which are focused around Jesus and his various roles and aspects. So this talk being Jesus the prophet. I'm going to try and be careful tonight because quite a few of the prophecies that Jesus gives do tend to overlap with some of the other subjects, especially next week's one that being the sacrifice of Jesus. So I just want to start off by going over what the job of a prophet is and um, the role of the prophet to whoever it may be. So the job of a prophet essentially is to proclaim the will of God to the intended audience, whether this be the Jews, the Gentiles or an individual. And this is normally done through showing signs, wonders, miracles, that God has given them to be able to prove that they are from God. And it can also include prophecies, being able to foretell the future as God shows it to them. Now, this can be done through uh, precise detail, such as when it came to Jesus a couple of weeks ago, when they were talking about his birth. We knew where he was going to be born. We knew his name, while other prophecies that are given to man are quite full of imagery when we look at Revelation and Daniel. And Jesus tends to focus more on the precise and they all tend to be within the next couple of years, although there is a more uh, imagery based one when it starts talking about the return of Jesus. So then what was Jesus's message and who was it to? Obviously, that was the role of the prophet. So Jesus's message was mainly to the Jews. But there was bits when he went out to the Gentiles and went to the Samaritans, which we're coming to later. But most of his message, we actually know because of how much is prophesied about him in the Old Testament. And when it comes to Jesus's own prophecies that he gives, quite a lot of them are based on Old Testament prophecies about him. And then he's expanding on them as God is revealing them to him at the time. But the message that he basically centers his three years when he's preaching in Israel, focus around the good news of the kingdom of God, his death and resurrection, the new covenant which he is bringing, the Sabbath being God's gift to man, and some of the other issues that the scribes and Pharisees had caused in Israel and to those trying to live God's word and God's will, and they had corrupted it for their own purposes. So the reason that I went to or wanted John to read Deuteronomy 13 is because when we look at the Old Testament, when it talks about what a prophet should and shouldn't do, Deuteronomy 13 sets out that they have to do signs and wonders, as we read through the first three bit, first three verses, sorry. But it also then focuses on the message that they give has to be bringing the people back to God and not taking them away from it. And this is the key thing when you are testing the prophets, which we also see in the New Testament when we turn to one John and other passages that the prophet can do as many signs and wonders as they want. But the message has to be bringing people to God. That is the purpose of the prophet. And if the prophet does not follow this and they are taking people away from God, then the Israelites at that time in the Old Testament were told to take that person and stone them to death for not doing God's will. And we'll be discussing what the Israelites did to Jesus, although he's proven himself to be a prophet later, and also how that then cascades on and includes the end of Deuteronomy chapter 13. The next test for being proven as a prophet is in Deuteronomy chapter 18. So if you'll turn with me very quickly to Deuteronomy chapter 18, please. And in verses 15 to pretty much the end, it talks about a prophet being raised up by God after the likeness of Moses. So Moses was the first prophet that God sent to bring the people of Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery and to take them to the promised land. Unfortunately, they never quite got there due to their unbelief. And Moses never got there either because of uh, a couple of errors that he had made. 
But here we see in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 to the end, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. According to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see again this great fire any more, lest I die. So here it sets out the purpose of the prophet, being the one that intercedes for God, for the people, the one that takes God's message and goes and speaks it to them. And then reading on verse 17, and the Lord said to me, what have they spoken? What they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. So again, hearkening back to Deuteronomy chapter 13. And then here's where it talks about how you shall test the prophet. In verse 21, and if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the things does not happen, will come to pass. That is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. So there it sets out that the prophet has to, what they say has to come to pass. So when we then look at the prophecies that Jesus gives in order to prove that he is a prophet using Deuteronomy chapter 18, it has to come to pass of everything else he said is null and void essentially so all the message that he's given them they can ignore if what he says will come to pass does not happen so then we we'll start moving on to the prophecies a lot of the ones that jesus gives and a lot of the prophecies given by those in the old testament actually focus around the blessing and cursings that god has said will come upon israel if they do or do not obey his word so when we look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, 28, sorry, and we'll just turn there very quickly. You have the Israelites being given a whole list of things that if they follow the Lord their God, that they shall receive. And if they do not follow the Lord their God, will come about them as calamities. And when we start looking at some of the Old Testament prophecies that happened to the Israelites, you can see that God has said that they will come about in Deuteronomy 28. So therefore, the prophecies that God has given to his prophets to give to the people are just fulfillments of what God has said will happen right from the founding of Israel. So when we look at them being scattered by the Babylonians, it's here in Deuteronomy chapter 28. When Elijah says that there will be droughts and famines in the land, it's here in Deuteronomy chapter 28 as well. And that's how we can start seeing that the prophecies are going to come about if the people stop following God then God has said these things will happen and then it's just the prophet's job to tell them I've said this will happen and now this is when it's going to happen to you so the first prophecy we're going to be looking at that Jesus does is the destruction of Jerusalem and for that we'll be turning to Luke chapter 23 please So in Luke chapter 23, Jesus has already been condemned by the high priests, by the Pharisees and by Pilate and therefore the Romans as well. And they're leading him out to die and he's having to carry his own cross. And Luke chapter 23 and verse 27, you've got the people watching Jesus carrying his cross along the road and they're weeping for him. And Jesus turns around to them and says, um, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that they never bore, and breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things in the greenwood, what will be done in the dry? 
and we also get throughout the rest of the gospel Jesus prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem and indeed we can actually see that it happened in AD 70 under the general Titus of the Roman army when they came in and they utterly destroyed Jerusalem but the additional thing is that the Roman army left for a certain amount of time allowing for those in the city who believed to be able to escape the city and this is why when Jesus says in Luke chapter 23 that they will say blessed are those barren womb because they're not having to carry children they're not having to run out of the city they're not having to escape with their children and here we can actually see that Jesus's proof as a prophet is guaranteed because what he said will come to pass has happened we know that Jesus died around AD 30 AD 33 and yet the destruction happens in AD 70 it happens within a lifespan of the people that have heard the message therefore Jesus is shown to be a true prophet. He's shown to be speaking the will of God. But why does the destruction of Jerusalem happen? Well, when we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 13, at the end of the chapter, it talks about those that have enticed the city away from God will be put to the sword and destroyed. And we see that when Jesus is being given over to Pilate, that the Pharisees and the high priests, they say that Caesar is our only king. They are sacrificing the one that God has sent, the one true saviour of the world, the one that is leading them back to God. And they're saying that Caesar is their king. Did they like Caesar? No. In fact, they rebelled against him, causing AD 70 to come about, in, if you look at it from man's point of view. But they were then actually saying, man is our king. We submit ourselves to man and not to God. We do not want to do what God wants, although God had planned for Jesus to die. They were turning their back on him and they enticed the city to turn against Jesus and have him crucified, which we read about in Deuteronomy chapter 13. So again, we see that the prophecy that Jesus is given is based on that which God had said would happen back in the Old Testament. And then in Matthew chapter 23 as well, in verses 37 to the end, we see Jesus also expanding on this and saying, O Jerusalem, that thou shalt see me again. Sorry, let me start that again. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37 to the end. O Jerusalem, your house is left desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more. So you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So there we see that Jesus is saying he won't see Jerusalem again properly now after his death until he comes again to restore God's kingdom. And the Israelites had completely got the prophecies about Jesus wrong from their interpretation of the Old Testament. Because when we read Matthew chapter 21 verse, verse 9, which is Jesus' triumphal entrance into Jerusalem when he's riding upon the colt of a donkey. They are singing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And yet that prophecy is only partially fulfilled when Jesus enters Jerusalem the first time. The full potential, the full final fulfillment of that prophecy is when Jesus returns and sets up the kingdom. The next prophecy rolls sort of off the destruction of Jerusalem and that's the destruction of the temple and we're talking about the destruction of the temple building for this prophecy but we see that when AD 70 happened and the Romans went in they destroyed Jerusalem they carried on and they destroyed the temple as well and this was yet again fulfillment of what God had said would happen in the Old Testament and yet Jesus was here prophesying about it before his time of death and to prove that he had been a prophet sent by God. And what do I mean by the fact that it had been told by God in the Old Testament that it would come to pass? Well, when a house was leprous, the priests went in, they checked it, and then they went back a second time. And if the leprosy had come back, essentially, 
then they removed all the bricks, removed all the stones, and they went back a third and final time to see if that had happened. And we see this when Jesus goes into the temple with the money changes and he drives them out. And then the second time when he visits Jerusalem, that happens again. And then the third and final time, he's not actually able to go and fulfill the final destruction of the leprous, the full of sin temple. And therefore we have the prophecy that the temple will be destroyed because it has not become a place of God. It's become a place for man. And we see another place where Jesus actually goes to the Gentiles this time. And he's again identified as being a prophet. And that's in John chapter four, verses one to 26, which is when he's with the Samaritan village. And here he's at a well and his, his disciples have gone away to get him something to eat. And a Samaritan woman comes up to him and Jesus asks her for a cup of water. Quite simple, quite normal. And yet Jesus also then goes on to talk about how he will give her the water of life. And when this questioning goes on and she's asking for this water so that she never have to go to the will again. Jesus asks her to go and get her husband. And the woman says, rightly, I've had, I have no husband. And Jesus says, you've had five men, but none are your husband. And she uses this to identify the fact that Jesus is a prophet. How? The fact that he knows all this about her, yet he's never met her, doesn't know anything about her. And yet he knows her deeply. Therefore, it has to be God revealed to him about her. And then he goes on to talk about the fact that the Jews have Jerusalem, where they worship God. The Samaritans have their own places where they worship God. But salvation shall, salvation shall come by the Jews. But there is a time coming and is now. That worship shall be done in spirit and in truth. For the temple will be no, needed no more. So we see that the physical temple that gets destroyed in AD 70, which is prophesied by Jesus, not only is it full of sin, but it is no longer required because everyone now can go to God directly through Jesus, which is what we see when he's in his death, when the veil is torn. And that is why Jesus prophesies the destruction of the temple. Leading on to that, the next prophecy that we're going to be looking at tonight is his death and resurrection and built into this is his prophecy of the fact that the temple will be destroyed and he will rebuild it in three days now of course the fact that he'd already prophesied the destruction of the temple is a completely separate matter to that although the jews didn't see it that way because they go on about how long it takes them to build it and yet they're missing the point that the temple isn't the physical body it's jesus himself being the way to God and this is where I'm having to be quite careful not to go on to next week's subject so in John chapter 2 and verses 18 to 20 the Pharisees are doing their job and actually coming to him and asking to see a sign because Jesus is at this point still having to prove that he is a prophet to them so he talks about this fact that the temple will be destroyed and will be rebuilt in three days as his sign that he is sent by God, that he is a prophet. And this is one of the uh, prophecies we see that is actually prophesied about long before Jesus was even born. When Jesus was born and he, at the age of 12, went to the temple and recognised that he was God's son and was going to be doing his will, he could look back at passages like Psalm 22 and many other places which talk about Jesus's own death. And this is one of the strange instances where we can see how prophecies have an impact on those that they are about and how they affect them. For Jesus, it was very simple. That is what God's will is. And I'm going to do it because that is what I want to do. I want to do God's will. He is completely submitting to his father's purpose and therefore when he prophesies about his own death it's his own free will choosing to do that he could very well have chosen to have gone off and done his own thing even though god had said that this will happen because god knew that who jesus was and he would do his will he's able to say that jesus would do it and jesus himself is able to say 
he will do it. And God then reveals to him, even in more detail than that prophesied beforehand, what will happen to him, how it will happen and when it will happen. So he knows exactly when he needs to be in Jerusalem, what will happen to him and eventually his death on the cross and then his resurrection afterwards. And when he's talking about his own death, there's only one group that actually listens and recognises what Jesus is saying about his death and resurrection. And that, strange enough, is the Pharisees. His own disciples are told multiple times. I think it's three times in one gospel. He goes on about the fact that he will die and raise again on the third day. And yet none of them take it in. But the Pharisees, after they've put him to death, say he had said this would happen. He would raise on the third day. And therefore they ask for a guard to be put onto his tomb. Of course, it doesn't work because Jesus is raised by God and it's God that scares the guards away. But I think it's just worth noting that sometimes Jesus will give prophecies and we can be blind to them. We can miss the purpose of them and we need to be clear watching and waiting and we need to know what Jesus has said and remember what it is. So the next prophecy that Jesus gives happens very, very quickly after he goes on to say it, because we're now going to talk about Peter, because obviously with Jesus's death and resurrection, Peter was there in the garden when Jesus got arrested. And we read in Mark 14 verses 27 to 31 that Jesus prophesies to Peter that he will deny him three times before the crock the the chicken crows and peter argues back and says no lord i will be with you till the end and then as the day goes on as they get to gethsemane and jesus goes ahead and prays and then judas arrives peter's actually there ready to fight he draws his sword and he starts fighting the high priest servant by cutting off his ear he thinks he's going to be with jesus even to death and he's ready to prove it He's headstrong, but he's missed the point completely. Jesus has already said, you are going to fall short. You're not ready yet, Peter. You're not doing God's will. You're following your own. You've not quite got the message yet. Even though I've told you this will happen. And of course, what happens, Peter flees to start off with. And then he comes to where Jesus is being judged with John and he denies him just as Jesus had prophesied that he would. A very individual, very precise prophecy. And Peter, recognising that he had denied his Lord three times, flees completely. And then after Jesus' resurrection, he's the first one that runs to the tomb Perhaps now he's starting to remember what Jesus has already prophesied about his resurrection because of what the women have said after returning from his tomb and finding it empty. And then jumping on a bit, we come to Galilee, where Jesus had said he would meet them after he's been raised. And Jesus gives him yet another prophecy. He tells him that he is going to die. He says that, Peter, when you were young, you girded yourself and you went where you willed. But in your old age, someone else will gird you and you'll be taken where you do not want to go. And it's complete change from the first prophecy, which says, Peter, you are not ready yet. You are doing your own will. You are not doing God's. And then he switches it to, you're now ready, Peter. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. You are going to follow me now till the end. And I can tell you that with certainty because God has revealed it to me. We then switch that to the next prophecy, which deals with Judas who portrays Jesus. Because Pete, Jesus says that one of you will betray me. And when Judas, Judas sorry, at the feast gets up to go 
Jesus reveals that it's him through the dipping of the of the bread into the sop. He knows exactly who is going to betray him. And yet he's still there trying to help Judas not to do this, not to turn his back on God, not to betray the son of God. And he's there telling him exactly what he's going to do. And of course, Judas still goes and does it. He, like Peter, betrays Christ. And what does Judas do about it? Well, he goes and kills himself at the end. And we see that Jesus had warned both of them what they're going to do. And we ourselves need to be careful because we are told to be strong until the end. And we need to make sure that we are like Peter, that when we make mistakes, we still know that there is a way back. And we don't go and throw it all away, as did Judas. We then come to Jesus's more vague, not vague, imprecise prophecies, and that being the signs of the times, which are detailed in Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 to 14, and Luke chapter 21, where it talks about the things that will be happening before Jesus returns to this earth. And this is what we ourselves are still now waiting for and watching for. These are the very things that we should be focusing our lives on watching for, because we need to know when Jesus is coming. We need to be watching for our Christ's return to this earth. And it's strange when we start looking at the world around us today, because some of the things mentioned have increased massively over the last 2000 years. When we talk about the rise of false prophets and false teachings, just the amount that have happened in America over the past couple of years is incredible. According to a study done in America, there has been a rise of 83% of the false prophets and false teachings. If you talk about the love of many believers growing cold, the fact that so many people in this world don't even believe that there's a God anymore, when you compare that to before World War I, World War II, when pretty much everyone in the Western world was going to church and was of some denomination at least, is a major thing that's going on. People's ideologies, people's views in the world are changing. People are turning away from God and the world is becoming less moral as a result. We talk about um, there being race, inequality and everything. When we look at America at the moment, there are almost civil wars erupting between the left and the right political views because people are turning away from God and they're turning to politics and their own ideologies. There are riots going on and I think in one place in America there's been 86 riots, nights of riots over Black Lives Matter. People have lost what it is that their lives are based on. They have lost God completely and they're trying to attach themselves to anything that's going on, any ideology, any theology, anything that's going on that's got nothing to do with God. Wars and national conflicts have been increasing exponentially. When we talk about World War I and World War II, people saying that they would be the world to end all wars. I don't think there's been a year since that there has been no conflict, no war anywhere. Earthquakes and other natural disasters have increased and we're now seeing to tsunamis being caused by earthquakes under the sea in various places as well. We then talk about famines. There has been famines increasing again in Africa over the past couple of years. And then when we want to talk about pestilence, which is in Luke chapter 21, we're living in one right now, coronavirus. The fact that everything at this moment is indicating that Christ is returning soon should not be ignored. The fact that all of Jesus' other prophecies have been proven to be true, have proven him to be of God, to be the great prophet, means that the other prophecies he has made we should be watching and we should be reading and learning about and watching out for. And therefore we come then to the fact that Jesus is 
the prophet after Moses, which is in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verses 15 to 18. What makes Jesus the great prophet, the next prophet after Moses, and makes him different from every other prophet that had been since? It's his relationship with God. All the other prophets had different ways of being given their prophecies, being given God's will that they were meant to show by being divinely inspired. Some of them had visions and dreams such as Daniel and Joseph. Sorry. We have words that they were given to write, which is Isaiah and many others. They have got words put into their mouth, such as Balaam, and he had gone there to actually curse the people of Israel. And yet Jesus and Moses were a prophet set apart, a prophet different, because they had a relationship with God. Jesus was in constant communication with his father. When they talk about prophets, is God putting his word into their mouth or, or making them write what he wants them to write? When it comes to Jesus... He knew God. He was a manifestation of God on earth. God was literally there with him. And it was such an intense relationship that pretty much everything Jesus said was either needing to be in place then and there, such as the Beatitudes that he gives us or part of his message, or if it's going to happen, it was a prophecy. We can guarantee that if Jesus said something was going to happen, it's going to happen. And it's also interesting the fact that because there was so much written about Jesus before he was even born, when he prophesies about something happening, we can already see that he knew it was going to happen. He was living in that prophecy and therefore just adding little bits onto it as God reveals it to him. Such as when we talk about the triumphal entrance, he knows exactly where the cult is going to be. He knows what people are going to say to his disciples when they ask what the cult's for. He knows all of it, just as God knows exactly what's going to happen in the world around us. It seems that Jesus had exactly that same mentality, the same vision revealed to him by God, because he was able to do exactly what God needed then and there. When Lazarus was going to die, he waited because that's what God had revealed for him to do. I think it was any of us would normally rush there to try and save our friend. But Jesus was so in tune with his father that everything that God wanted him to do, he was aware of and he had already started to do. And therefore, when we talk about Jesus being a prophet, he wasn't just a prophet. He was the greatest prophet because he had that connection with God. His prophecies even go further when we start looking at revelation yes john wrote the book revelation but when we read revelation chapter one it is the revelation of jesus christ and then at the end of the chapter for revelation chapter one it's jesus telling john to write down what he has seen revelation is jesus's final prophecy to us it's his way of warning us shining showing us guiding us what is going to happen in the world around us and how we need to be ready. When he talks about the ecclesias at the start of it, how some of them are lukewarm, how some of them have fallen from their first love, it's all warnings to us as well. He is revealing what he needs us to do, how we should be his disciples. And therefore, that is what makes Jesus the great prophet. And he's proven he is sent by God and not just a prophet. Thank you.